All right, 2 Kings chapter 8. Again, let's call this one Fugitive to Father, but subtitle it Waiting for the Right Circumstances, because in this chapter, we're going to see the story of Elisha warning the Shunammite woman that there is going to be a seven-year famine in Israel, so she needs to go to a place where they can eat. And so she is going to sojourn amongst the Philistines for seven years, but Upon returning to Israel, she is going to seek permission of the king to recover her abandoned territory. And as she is doing that, is going to describe the king as actually talking to Elisha's servant Gehazi, having asked Gehazi, tell me of the great things that Elisha has done. And as Gehazi is explaining some of the miracles, one of the miracles is raising the Shunammite woman's son as they begin to look and see the Shunammite woman. Gehazi's going to be like, there she is, and there he is, which is going to persuade the king to basically assign an officer to make sure that she gets everything that she left restored in full from the day that she left to sojourn amongst the Philistines. The next story it's going to tell us, however, is the story of the progression of leadership in Syria. As the king of Syria is going to get ill and send a man by the name of Hazael to get word from Elisha whether or not he will recover. And in doing so, Hazael will say, your servant, Ben-Hadad, going back to that change in status that we seem to see earlier in the seven chapters we're looking at for this week, when we saw Naaman begin to describe himself as Elisha's servant. Now, again, we're seeing a level of respect develop where Ben-Hadad is now, at least in the eyes of Hazael, being described as Elisha's servant. Understanding that the news is going to be good in part. Yes, you will recover, but the full news is you're not going to make it for very much longer because Hazael is going to be the new king of Syria, and that is what Elisha is going to tell him. And so when Hazael returns, he doesn't waste any time or wait for any recovery. The next day, after giving Ben Hadad news that he would recover, Hazael is going to take matters into his own hand, wetting a rag and smothering Ben Hadad, taking over the reins of. Syria. And so finally, in the last section, we're going to see the succession of the kings of Israel described as well. Uh, understanding that Jehoram is presently the king in Israel who is going to be succeeded by Ahaziah, his son. But the details of that are going to be described in chapter 9. For now, there may be two takeaways. Understanding that as we see the widow of Zarephath simply going back to try to ask the king to restore what was hers, God was already arranging the circumstances in a way that didn't require her to have to do much at all, which is one of the reasons why we talked about in previous chapters, why it matters to try to live to our potential, because there are situations where we could exhaust our energy, our resources, and our words on trying to persuade people of things they just wouldn't care to do. And we don't know whether or not the king of Israel would or would not have cared to honor her request, but we know that she didn't have to worry about it because God had arranged the circumstances in a way where it simply wasn't necessary. And because of the kindness that she got into the habit of showing Elisha, she ended up with a son she might not have otherwise had at her advanced age, a family that did not have to suffer in Israel during the seven years of famine and full recovery of the property that she had abandoned during the seven years that they spent living amongst the Philistines understanding that her kindness to Elisha preceded God arranging circumstances to care for her family in ways that she almost certainly could not have done on her own. Likewise, though, when circumstances bring us good fortune, they can also expose different sides of our character. And that's exactly what happened with Hazael, where, as we saw with Jeroboam and Solomon, Hazael realized during his visit to Elisha, oh, wait a minute, the guy I'm serving, I can be him? It completely changed his perspective, meaning within a very short period of time, he was killing the man he was trusted to serve. Understanding that Ben-Hadad or whoever the kings of Syria had been during the time when Naaman was cured of his leprosy and their armies were spared when they were brought blind to the king of Israel, uh, they returned that courtesy with more war. Uh, understanding that that kind of disloyalty is the kind of thing that actually set an example for Hazael once he realized that he was destined to be king himself, potentially helping us understand the wisdom of the way in which David started out his reign, refusing to put his hands on Saul, even when Saul had fallen into David's hands. Even more than that, punishing those who had claimed responsibility for harming the kings of Israel, thinking that they were bringing David a present. He repeatedly said, 
touch not God's anointed. And so even if David was overthrown, he had at least done his best to set an example that that was not the kind of character with which he was going to lead Israel. And so now we're seeing Ben-Hadad, a man who did not so much repay kindness with kindness, now having his servant likewise repay him in kind. As we will go to the next chapter, seeing an even greater example in Israel's transition of power of the ways in which power can generate only so much loyalty.